to begin this episode. Hello everyone. The title of tonight's episode is A Future in the Sky. And um, I want to speak about a concept that I am in some sense extracted or in some sense was inspired to write in a science fiction novel I'm working on. There's a couple I'm working on, but today, tonight's episode is going to be more, rather than an internal um, self-inquiry, more towards an external responsibility. What that means is, let us consider a world that has become enlightened. What does such a world do? And in some sense, the world has no choice but to progress through the phases that nature provides. The reason I said pilots of consciousness in the subtitle, Sky Cities and Pilots of Consciousness, I'll tell you those ideas straight up and then I'll kind of dive into them more. I've kind of developed this concept I call pilots of consciousness rather than meditators, spiritual seekers, mystics. I like the title pilots of consciousness because we're conscious beings and once we realize we are our whole moment, we in some sense our free will is the navigation of our attention to the next experience. So when I realize like what our free will is, our free will is pretty much how we direct our attention, you know? Your free will is not per se the action, it is, it is how you even saw an, uh, a reality to be acted in. Do you see? So it has to do with attention. And uh, back in the day in ancient Vedic times, there was a concept called seers of thought. And the rishis were pretty much that. The rishis were these very sacred beings, these sacred people. Well, in some sense, they could observe their thoughts to a depth that they could see through the natural pattern of their thoughts, the echoes of future civilizations. And in some sense, their wisdom stands on a pillar that I find is beyond space and time. So the seer of thought was someone who, uh, who, who realized, like most people nowadays, you ask them who they are, they feel their thoughts. You know, they're like, my, my idea of me is a thought. You know, what else could it be? Right? And that's, I've, I've talked about that in other talks, but... What I want to focus on is that these series of thought, the, the, the most fascinating thing is the result of any sort of revelatory experience. So these rishis would write books. There was a man named Rishi Vyasa. <clears throat> He's very well known in Indian culture. And uh, this man, I have a very, I have a very, like the moment I, I just the concept of this person came to me, I found it very, I was drawn toward it, right? And so Rishi Vyasa was this man who wrote 18 Puranas, evidently wrote 18 books on society, civilization, and through stories in a certain unique way on, on like some sort of leaf-like, uh, you know, paper or something. Right? And after writing 18 books, this, this man was guided by an intuitive force. That intu- after, the, after listening to that intuitive force, internal, intu- I don't want to say internal, I don't know. But after listening to that intuitive, I, like the way I see Rishi Vyasa is that he's a, he's a bright story from the past. You know? And so <clears throat> Rishi Vyasa, after he writes these 18 books, he's not satisfied. He feels like he's brought down in some sense, the profoundest sort of wisdom and knowledge, like he's, ex- he's brought thoughts from the unknown that were never before present uh, in the veins of civilization. And so after he did that, he did not feel satisfied. And there's this very profound story. I think there's many interpretations of this, but the one I heard was in some sense that an angel, like after writing these 18 books, he feels incomplete still, right? After in some sense, uh, landing unique knowledge from the unknown into pretty much um, the conscious realm. He was not satisfied. And the story says that an angel comes to him through a person. And that, I found that interesting too, but that, that could be for another time. But uh, an angel comes to him and says, Rishi Vyasa, the only way you will find that sense of completeness, which you, that like and the only way you can 
satisfy the element of the story because after you focus on civilization, after you have piloted through civilization's games for eons, you will begin paying attention to the origin of all origins. You begin to wonder. You, you will not be. It's as if, like, for me, fear was a distraction from truth. You know, the best time to explore life is while you're alive. <laughs> Anyways, um, Rishi Vyasa writes that book, and that book is, uh, I believe, the Shirimad Bhagavatam, or the Bhagavad Gita. He pretty much writes the story, the story of a sort of divine comprehension of universal alignment with the origin of the universe. Yeah. So anyways, the idea of pilots of consciousness came to me. I'm like, why are people acknowledging themselves as meditators? Why are people acknowledging themselves like... Like a, 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 a kind of task, like if I was a knight back in the day doing tasks, <laughs> you know, in medieval times, like my first task with these talks was to, in some sense, take people's attention to studying language before metaphysics or mysticism, you know, and what, what that means is you self-inquire how you feel your thought in a, in a character in a, in a story, you know. Because everybody's story has an edge. Everybody's reality has an edge where beyond that edge is the unknown and they don't know. You know, you can bring the greatest, like let's say for example, <laughs> you bring the most enlightened yogi who's, who's just sat in samadhi for years and you ask him to fix a computer. You know, that, that suddenly when that man looks at the computer, he could put an effort and he could intuitively be guided to somehow miraculously make the computer, but there is an edge of the unknown in, so, in a sort of conceptual interpretation of reality. That means I consider there's a world in front of your eyes and there's a world behind your eyes, and I'm not afraid to say this, you know? Because the, these two, it, it's as if we are oscillating between existence and non-existence, uh, existence and non-existence, emptiness and fullness, individualness and collectivism. Where your 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 intelligence is co constantly considering, what if I don't exist? What if I exist? You know, it happens in with the blinks of the eye, which you know, seldom people notice. <laughs> so, anyways. <clears throat> The concept of pilots of consciousness was a, the reason I brought it. I'm like, rather than us trying to find some sort of mystical enlightenment where all these people in the New Age community, they're being drawn towards certain gurus, I thought we, it's, it's like that kind of point in life where we can't just go in our own uh, spirituality as we have to become responsible for materiality, you know? Because the concept of a spirit will cease to exist the moment there's nothing to have a spirit. You see. <laughs> this doesn't mean there's nothing there, you know. It, it's like as much as your eyes are open in the fullness of the world, they will also be open to the emptiness of the world, but they will no longer be eyes based on a, a form. That means right now you're a life form. Now you take away the form. What is left? Just life force. This life force doesn't need to have a personality. As long as you think you do, and when I say a personality, personality is a social and cultural responsibility, right? So when I'm like, I, I might give in, uh, say these talks, you know, give these late night kind of Mr. Within's gift talks, you know, <laughs> but like the, 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 my mind, <clears throat> rather than to be just something I could tell you in belief, is this dynamic phenomenon, okay? So for me, there are some aspects of my reality I can control, I can pilot, okay? For example, these words that I'm telling you, I can pilot. But when it comes to my heartbeat or how I'm breathing, you know, it's as if this, it, it is all occurring alongside nature. You know, I am a flower in a flower garden that is endless. And that is what existence is. And that is what the journey of time is. Because without time, space has nothing to do with. And if we are creatures that are doing things in our reality, do you see, we require space and time as long as there requires to be a character in a story. 
So pretty much the mystical question is, this character that is in some story of life, you know, every person has their own story of life, they tell themselves. Yeah. <laughs> and that story, believe it or not, changes all the time, you know? Or rather than changes, deepens, you know? Uh, there's this concept I brought that's called experience tunneling, and it pretty much when you direct your attention in one moment, you, internally many experiences begin to project, and at the same time, your moment of life is like you're going to get one experience to another experience to another experience, and so pretty much we're tunneling, tunneling with our knowledge consciously into the unconscious and the unknown. And for me, I wondered, like, I looked at this um, psychedelic community, I, there was a time I was introduced to Terence McKenna's talks, <clears throat> and Terence McKenna is an ad, advocate of psychedelics, I'll say that straight up, and there are many points of his discussion that I am on a different side, like I, I do not agree with everything he says, but I have an incredible respect where, you know, I, I if he was here, I would not, how can I tell you, it's like, this man's eyes were very open to the world, and to the inner world. So, so anyways, what I'm trying to say is, is that um, with the same curiosity of psychedelics, I kind of noticed that these people are trying to use substances to navigate their state of mind or to explore a new state of mind. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get to. So this state of mind, it's like this very profound relationship. You know, it's not like all human beings have just opened their eyes and they've just looked at the world and they've seen its vastness and immensity. You know, there have been also some people who've seen that vastness and immensity, but have also seen the vastness and Im immensity of the opposite side. You see, um, because mindfulness is being aware of the duality of your moment. All right. This doesn't mean like, like, how can I say it? We are trying to pilot our consciousness towards clarity and clarity is like a sort of adventurous breaking of the past into the new all right so for me you tell me what is more exciting this is this is a very good question i'll ask what is more exciting you listening to someone's ideas someone else or you having a new experience of how you're even considering thought there has to be a sort of <clears throat> intuitive abidement into a trust that allows new experiences to enter. You know, most people, if you're, if you're listening to, to do these kind of talks for something, you see there's two mentalities. There's a mentality of giving and there's a mentality of taking. These two mentalities pretty much dictate every human being. You know, you want to see who's a good friend, who's a bad friend, just look at the mentality. Look at, look at the greed of the human species. You know, I, from the beginning I was born, I've been walking in a museum because so many people have not updated their mannerisms of, of behavior than their past generations. They think they have, but they haven't. And what I mean by that is that for now, if you ask what is our free will being maneuvered by, <laughs> it is being maneuvered by a biological intelligence and a subjective intelligence that we for now in this current uh, like in 2019 the mainstream still believes <laughs> you know that it's just from the brain we have made the brain the god of the unknown and all the secrets are there and what if there is a chance that, that there are many worlds in one that there are in one moment, there are many dimensions of presence. As if you not only exist as an ideological self, you also exist as a biological self, and you also exist as a momentary self. The momentary self is how your attention is being the spherically endless. It's like your senses, when it's like most people thought back in the day that your sensory perception, you had to limit it and you had to meditate on it and then you'd see beyond the senses. Okay, but in, I, it's as if when you give yourself ultimate freedom, that means you, you don't have an opinion on how the unknown should be or how your knowledge should be. Patterns of 
different concepts that I would see relate to them. You know? And when I say geometric, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you how thoughts can be, thoughts are just how your attention, like, just study your attention. You know? Most people said pay attention. <laughs> You don't miss it with the saying, no, 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 you don't need to pay attention to anything, you know, don't, don't pay any, like, your advancement is based on your inner update, not your outer update. Most people update their outer life and they're like, oh my god, man, you know, I'm like, I'm cool now. <laughs> but when you update your inner reality, you are treating yourself as an honorable moment of existence that deserves an honest outcome, you know? That means it, there are two kinds of kids in this world. <laughs> and I say kids because I remember this, this being in this state when I was younger, much younger, like, you know, maybe like when I was 14. Yeah. One state of mind chooses to shape its outcome before it enters the moment, and once one state of mind chooses not to shape the outcome. For me, I have learned to use thoughts. You know, most people are just their thoughts. When I say I have learned to use thoughts, that means I have a relationship with whatever is present in my attention is interconnected with all that I know. And this interconnectivity provides a multidimensionality which is ac only accessible in one moment, as if like you drew one dot and then you drew just endless lines, you know, at different angles. You see? That's kind of the reality we're going to. We, we, you're like still the same person, but every year you blow the candle, your body's different and your ideology is different. So in a changing world, our species is fighting over beliefs and disbeliefs. I feel we haven't done the greatest explorations and expeditions into knowledge, into like the educational system is, is, is starving for the unknown. <laughs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> once developing this concept of pilots of consciousness and through certain in inspiring visions I received of a sort of science fiction scenario, in, in, I'll, I'll get to now the concept of a future in the sky and sky cities. You see, in, in various novels, science fiction novels that I've written, and some of them are complete and some of them are incomplete, in these novels, I, I am drawn towards my, like, I'm, I'm just looking at myself while writing this book and just being like, okay, let's see how far I can, in some sense, see a sort of future, you know? And not in, in the sense that I want to see something, but I was like, if I clearly look at this present moment, and discover the momentum of cur the current conception, like how sh society is showing itself to me, what could be the potential? So when you wonder about what it, you, your potential is, you get a bit more inspired, no? You know, if you suddenly see, like, you know, somebody doing something you want to do, you suddenly get inspired, you know? You get this feeling in you, okay, I, I feel like I can direct my effort somewhere, you know? And eventually you will go through, uh, like, how, what is it? They say 10,000 hours to make, to, to attain mastery, you know? <laughs> you begin to see if, the, if you will seek the truth with such effort until, until it is effort, effortlessly accessible to you, you know? The novel is called Language, and it was my idea, like I had this idea of what would the first alien, 
like actual alien? What if the first alien came down to make contact? But first of all, it came to make contact in the year 2100. And what if this alien wasn't like how all the other movies are showing? What if this was an enlightened, lit, like very advanced, enlightened alien? Okay. And this alien was so intelligent, instantly it had concluded peace, you know. <laughs> and so now I thought, okay, let's, let's, how should we establish the, the realm of this concept, right? And so the way it came to me is that I felt in the year 2100, if we don't clean our act up as a species, we might be living in sky cities. That means we might not be living in Mars, but we're going to live in our atmospheres. And that's why I was uh, inspired to put this wallpaper photo. And honestly, I don't know who the artist is. I saw it in this site called this random site. But like, whoever the artist is, like, if you know, please write the name so I could credit them properly. Um, anyways, I, I put this artwork because this is like a glimpse, glimpse into a scenario where the surface of the earth has not become inhabitable, uh, uninhabitable, you know. So the concept is that um, an extraterrestrial arrives in a sky city and for in the year 2100, for many years, for many generations, kids have been born in the sky city and looking from the edges at the earth that they, could not, they, they can no longer walk on. Okay, we messed up earth, we can't live in it anymore. Okay, we burnt our house and then, you know, it's, it's then you gotta go live in the sky. <laughs> Anyways, so many generations of kids have been raised in this. Is, these are all very, very interestingly explained in this novel. You know, I've written it in a way, but I'll, I'll tell you. So what happens is the story begins in, in so, so I'll say from the beginning, 2000, the year 2100. Uh, um, for many years, humanity's just children, species has been, has been living in, I guess you can say, Perhaps magnetically inspired by sky cities, okay. And um, the alien named an alien named language arrives, and he arrives exactly. He knows where to be, so he arrives. He just manifests out of nowhere, as if like just stepping from a higher dimension into a, into a lesser one, you know. And so he, he just appears, and in this book, it's kind of strange, there's a sort of a concept of a general and a king. A general who has become a king, you know? But not, but not a king as if like this sky city, the way it's being governed, it's being governed by a general authority figure. Now the idea is that this avian arrives, and this kind of general king <laughs> of the sky cities of mankind, you know, is there, and suddenly, Suddenly, he realizes how liberated and clear this alien is. And this alien begins to suddenly speak, not through knowing exactly, but just re the reflections of these people's minds. That means, imagine if you're, if, you're, if you're in some sense, right now your brain was given off waves that have a certain geometrical design or showed, in some sense, what your imagination is, you know? This, the, for example, this extraterrestrial alien is seeing this. <laughs> is seeing all these all the thoughts you're having and based on their designs communicating to you so pretty much it's like you're a character in a video game and uh the creator creates himself in the video game as a character and comes as a character and says i'm the creator okay it's as if one can say perhaps this may be i'm not saying this in any way disrespectfully but <clears throat> and there's no but but <laughs> It's as if you can say the prophets were a way of the creator of the simulation trying to give hints, you know, to characters in the simulation, you know. <laughs> but, but anyways. The alien eventually realizes that human beings have not evolved beyond language and just tells them to call him language. Okay, I'm writing, and um, 
is a uh, name language. So eventually what happens is this general king suddenly gets this profound insight and begins to really like, uh, like plead this alien to teach his son first. And so the story then, the whole novel revolves around this enlightened extraterrestrial uh, walking in the sky city with this kid. Okay, and the kid's asking questions like, and their history on, on the sky cities is not accurate, as if a lot of knowledge was destroyed. So if these kids being born in these sky cities have no idea what happened on Earth, they're just head, fed like in the years of history, you know? So the story begins with this kid first asking about the history of himself. So first he asks about himself, and then he goes on asking about um, this extraterrestrial uh, language, right? And so it's very unique because this story is not per se an action-packed novel. It's not like something I've written where there's death and killing in it, okay? And, and not per se there isn't chaos, but it's, it's that the whole novel is just the conversations of this extraterrestrial with this kid of this general king of the sky cities, you know? And uh, the whole book revolves around that, you know? There's still parts of it I'm working on, you know? But uh, anyway, so, so the concept of sky cities um, in some sense, I introduced myself that way, okay? And this concept was, um, I thought that moment where if this was a real situation, human beings must, that it's as if we are, think of it this way, we are very advanced in our external reality, but very not advanced in our inner reality. That means when you see people when you see cr existential creatures destroying themselves, you see a species confused. You see a species that has forgotten the proper values to look at. You see a species convinced by their own chaotic ideas. You see a species that when it finds order, tries to again to bring it to, to, uh, to wield order with the hands of chaos. And in some sense, what can you expect from an animal, <laughs> from an advanced, sophisticated animal, which we consider ourselves to be? <sighs> to pilot your consciousness means to be able to be a being that can acknowledge an individual existence and acknowledge how that individuality only exists with a, a, a collective idea. You know, it's like a polarity. Again, the two sides of the coin cannot be separate. They're in some sense the same thing, the same, excuse me. Anyways, you are a moment of being that pilots its attention into different forms of existence. The, the, the effect of your attention is multidimensional. The cause of your attention is a sort of empty singularity. Okay? And what I mean by that is that what if right now you were a phenomenon that was undescribable? You see, with what we do not know, we're content. We're content with what we do not know yet. You know, it hasn't emerged in our conscious story of life. But when it does, our relationship with that experience, in some sense, we forget how we were before.
It is important that in your waking state, I have no expectation of anybody. Human beings go through three states of existence, okay? One state is the, your waking state. Right now you're listening to this talk in the waking state, you know? One state is in some sense the uh, dream state where you have dreams. And one is the deep sleep state. And in deep sleep, if you know this, nobody has an ego. Nobody is a sinner in deep sleep. So it is consciousness that is, in some sense, providing the possibility of designs to have more movement. So I'm saying right now we're in the waking state, okay? So I don't know if like all these people... <laughs> So in the New Age community, for example, they say, like, you know, we gotta awaken people. Everybody's a sleeping sheep, you know? We gotta we gotta bring their line from within, you know? <laughs> and I don't per se disagree with that idea, but like <clears throat> I have a different interpretation. But uh for me it's not it's not about waking up. You are already awake. Okay? Start your day simple. Allow it to slowly develop into a complexity which you can appreciate. What that means is most people get up from work, get up and they just have various thoughts roaming through their attention, you know, through their momentary attention to get to work, they're late. Okay, I've had that experience. <laughs> and so in that in those moments, it's as if just finding a still moment to sit in the subway where you can't do anything but wait for the subway to get there. You see, it's like in that moment, there is a sort of, I just sit and I see, wow, like I look at how, how fast the, the gears and the engines of my mind are working when I'm late for work. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I, I like to, in some sense, start the days with an appreciation of stillness and silence. You see, you only freak out um, at the end of this lifetime only if you have not, in some sense, in your waking state, studied its empty, not emptiness, but stillness and silence are, are, is the world where the mind dances in, okay? Any person, when you study the secrets of your attention, and honestly, you gotta, you gotta come, you gotta, Trust yourself enough to l allow your mind to reveal itself to you, okay? One can say any prophet in that moment of receiving revelation, okay? <laughs> in that moment, they were also having an experience they had never had before. So one can in instantly say novelty is, is, is the gate of revelation. And novelty means that the past cannot be carried anymore. Okay? The past cannot, is, the past is past. <laughs> Trust me, it's past. <laughs> but um, a sort of clarity of one's presence and a sort of unlocking one's potential intelligence requires a study of not the attention, the thoughts in your attention, and then you, you after you've studied, so the, like, okay, they don't say this to a lot of people who are interested in mysticism, but you gotta first find a sort of contentment and stability with external reality before uh, being able to taste fruitful meditation, okay? That means you gotta look at external reality and if you, this is the thing with desires or not. Desire is honestly just a way you're looking at things, okay? And uh, all these gurus who are like, don't follow your desires is because they were like, there is something in your eyes that seems to, seems to be more. This inner organizational intelligence is in some sense how our biological uh, uh, being is a sort of receiver of that which is beyond the biological. So think of it this way, as if you are what you consider to be physical reality is your reaction actually within a higher dimension, you know? 
So, so what I mean by that is that what, that higher dimension is not some abstract thing. It's it's how there is a thought, how how language is is in some sense generating worlds behind people's eyes as they think. As as and what is thinking it is pretty much like statements moving in one's attention. And so when you study your attention, first of all, you realize the responsibility of looking. You gotta, in every moment of wakefulness, be an observer. Cultivate conscious living. Because it is an opportunity. It is, it is, an, it is the result of not only a long biological process, but an eternal allowance for temporal experience. And something people didn't say, but who says eternity has to have an image to it to even be rejected? Who says the concept of soul or God or any of these have to have an image to be ex rejected in validity or, you know? Most people are fighting language. I've said this in so many talks. There's a war of language going on. There's a war of beliefs and ideology. And I've seen ideologies move mass minds. So if you think an ideology is a collective cloud-like entity, okay, and you see all those people inspired by that ideology, they're as if being moved in this cloud, in this network of that vision, okay? So for me, <clears throat> the chaos taught me not to believe my order, and my order taught me not to believe my chaos. And then when I was in that moment of doubt and disbelief, a sort of purity, pure feeling that you're no longer living in a lie, <laughs> in that moment I began to see the echo of dual, a, dual, a dualistic infinite echo. That means the problem with the intellect is that it puts, puts you in a labyrinth of infinite dualities that are interconnected. Because what is knowledge? It's pretty much you getting lost in the branches of knowledge rather than realizing the trunk is one. Whoever you are, learn from your intelligence. You know, this it's like right now you're listening to a computer or your phone or to, through some you're listening to some medium, you know, digital media. <laughs> to these talks, but my whole talks are me telling you your study of your mind is, is, is a better use of your time than running after dreams that you feel you can never reach. Okay? Because if we do not organize certain movements of re universal responsibility on the surface of our planet, within our civilization, I feel it's just going to be weird. It's as if like you could do something awesome, but the species is not doing it. Because it's greedy or it's selfish or shy or depressed or stressed or hates itself or tries to love itself or really loves itself or you know what I mean it's all stories you know and so you get an appreciation for silence because it is it is it is the space for language it is the space for noise <clears throat> In order to be able to unify mankind, we have to unify mankind before uh, it's, not before, but we have to unify it from a sort of separate identity. So what that means is for me, like what is, what is the world, believe it or not, guys? Like it, different countries, it's just groups of people living in parts of the land and just choosing to fit in into a certain costume of uh, tra tradition or heritage or modern culture or whatever. For me, it's, we're a bunch of creatures acting in our subjective realms, okay? But there are also 
it's as if you there is no such thing as an advantage or disadvantage because the moment what you see one of them the other is there simultaneously okay <laughs> um Imagine in different nations and societies, suddenly members of those communities woke up to, to an idea that they are not just cultural or social or national creatures. They are universal beings. They are beings that are an ex conscious extension of the universe. Okay, As if we are the eyes of the universe in our own story. Okay. And uh, when you suddenly consider that you're, it's the universe that's looking out through your eyes. Sometimes wisdom is being in the correct room. As different people in different uh, parts of the world suddenly begin to consider themselves as universal beings. And I find one of the earliest people to do this in history is Diogenes, where this Greek philosopher was was told, um, somebody came and asked him, like, where are you a citizen from? Oh, where are you a citizen of? And uh, Diogenes said, uh, me? <laughs> I'm a citizen of the cosmopolites. And the guy was stunned. Like, the guy who came to befriend him was immediately shocked, you know? And so, sometimes, the sign of a great mind is their endurance in um, natural isolation, okay? You gotta know how to handle life when you're alone and when you're with others, you know? As different people begin to see that the universe can be divided in any way. Like right now, you look at society, you're seeing it in one way. You could totally see it, all of it modified and changed into a different way. You know? You can look at the same thing in many ways, pretty much what I'm saying. I gotta find better drawing music. <laughs> um, perfect. This is one, one of my favorite tunes in existence. <laughs> the amount of talks I've given with Um, Handles is intelligence as if society is the mind of our species and different parts of the mind are eventually finding a sort of uh, unified alignment of uh, intelligent action. So, so what that means is as different people in societies begin taking universal responsibility, they also give universal freedom. Okay. Because, um, as I very interestingly heard, um, 
recently from Jordan Peterson. He said, uh, your responsibility, your rights are my responsibility, which was an excellent statement. And uh, pretty much what I'm saying is that a universal being sees a freedom to the universe that transcends thoughts that have been dictating your path behavior for years. Okay? Because most of life, like until when you get to your 30s, you're trying to rip off this blindfold that was just on your eyes, you know, since childhood. And that is what education should truly be about. It should be oriented to clarity of direct experience and knowledge and concepts and thoughts should be considered indirect experience. That means we must value experience in ways where we don't just say it can be elusive. We say, where is the illusion? It has to be in a present presence of truth. Do you know what I mean? What I mean is that you're directly experiencing your illusion. Your experience is is your access is is your is your divine mirror. You know. There's this very interesting quote from Tolkien. He says, "Not all those who I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right. Not all those who wander are lost." Do not be, do not have an opinion on your unknown until you are you have directly experienced uh, an original view. Okay. We, we are not just programs of biology and programs of how this biology is, in some sense, originated subjectivity for itself. Whether we consider a, a spirit in the machine, a soul in the body, or whether we consider that the intelligence of this organism in some sense generated a way of looking at itself or being conscious of itself it, it, that was in some sense more special than other creatures. That means perhaps a seed was planted in a field where the branches of that seed after it became a tree are in some sense, how can I say it? People are like branches, and their thoughts are like how the leaves on these branches change throughout the season. And so our experience of life is, in some sense, finding the best story to t for the species to tell itself, and that's where the responsibility for morality comes in. Because, believe it or not, it's the battle of stories, the battle of beliefs, the battle of Different design, abstract designs of the world are at war with one another. You believe this? <laughs> you know? But in, in, one can say, in chaos, one finds new order. So one can say, rather than you, most people being like, oh man, we're trashing this earth. Oh well, you know, I'm going to die, so I'm not going to be here to see the end of, end of ends, you know? <laughs> but I will tell you, Once you have completely become responsible for your present moment, all there is that is left is to be responsible for the future. Once you find the, your personal perfect life, you want your, for example, your kids to also have that perfect life. Yeah? And you want to continue the perfection of your observation throughout the eons. You know? And I've understood that nature chooses based on its own decisions, you know? That means, like, I've given all these talks. How many of these sentences I've said in these talks 
will pass the test of time, you know, let's say thousands of years if we go on, is not by my decision. So I have in some sense, I don't have too much of an expectation for these talks aside from an expectation from the audience to, to comprehend that you are interpreting everything. And so eventually you will find yourself that you'll go within. You'll see what I mean by this, this, why I'm saying the name Mr. Within, why I'm saying it's important for you to realize that this thing, what we, for language's sake, say is looking out through your eyes, this has an unknown and known factor. The known factor is in language. The unknown is up to you. The explorations in front of your eyes can be done with comrades, but the exploration behind your eyes, or I'm, I'm sorry to say, the universe is one. <laughs> As different people attain a sort of universal responsibility, they become beacons of a sort of higher freedom in their communities. And so people begin to look at these pe members of, of their society and be like, oh my God, they, it's as if behind their eyes they're living in a more, they are seeing more of the world. They're living in a better world, in an intelligent world. Imagine a, a, a world where renaissances happen every day. Imagine a world where we're not all just looking for cool objects to have. We're not only objectively or oriented, we're subjectively oriented, we're fascinated, and we understand that it is through the greatest peace that the greatest vision and genius arises. Peace is the soil of, of creativity. Because in peace, there is an allowance for that creativity to be there. I've spoken to many people, and I've asked them, do you have a creative dimension in your life? And honestly, sometimes when I speak, I find, like, I, you know, <laughs> um, the way I use language, it's, um, it could be odd sometimes, okay? But uh, it, I cannot, like, tell the waterfall, you know, like, I cannot tell Niagara Falls to stop flowing the way it does, you know? <laughs> I want you to be able to right now imagine some society, the most immediate society that comes, modern society that comes to your mind, whatever you think that is. Now I want you to imagine there are people in this society that are being classified. They are being classified based on what they have. Okay. And what I mean is that there's, for example, I say the inferior members and superior members of a society. Now, imagine the superior members of this thought experiment that I'm creating right now. Imagine the superior, they are just, the, rather than their attention being on their own greater superior, they're rather trying to control the inferior. Okay, and what I mean by that is, in, not, not to in, in some sense dive into the, the structure of mankind's greed, Okay, but I, I want to say that imagine there are valued members of society, members who uh, all the people in that society look brightly upon, and there are members of that society that those people, uh, most of the mem the majority of the people look dark. Uh, I'll say it darkly, <laughs> darkly. Whatever. That word probably that word probably doesn't exist, but <laughs> darkened kind of gaze at, at member of those members of society. And what I mean by that is that they have a sort of value uh, that could be universally, not, uh, not universally, but so the society can acknowledge. And there are so many people on this planet who have great values and great abilities. Creativity had the highest financial value, how it evolved our species would become. <laughs> you know, if children were being raised to Imagine a world where rather than all being raised to be engineers and businessmen, you know, and doctors, you know, imagine, um, I mean, doctors will grant them their own eternal place of existence. <laughs> but I'm saying pretty much rather than being just structurally oriented, you, you, you animate, you, you create novelty in your life. 
okay? And you create it by paying attention to a framework of the world that is beyond, that's working beyond, uh, beyond the previous frames. Okay. Um, Imagine in that society, suddenly there's a member of that society, and that and, and the society has many colors, many different personalities are existing in the same neighborhood, and they're influencing the whole neighborhood. Uh, uh, suddenly, one member of this society, this abstract society, I'm, I'm suggesting right now suddenly wakes up to this realization that none of the members of society are working for the they're not working as a planetary community they're working as their own separate as if we are still like even though castles are like very rare to find nowadays <laughs> but um in some sense, the kingdoms of ideology still exist. And these kingdoms of ideology have yet to realize the greater purpose. And the story of the Tower of Babel, which I, I often speak about, um, is the story of how all of mankind united to create this one structure that transcends, that ascends to uh, the heavenly knowledge, you know, that in some sense goes beyond the clouds where the gods were standing back in the day. Uh, all these human beings on all of humanity unites with one common language with the align and they begin moving to a point where they're reaching the, the, the truths of a higher dimension and suddenly the gods see this and the gods are like holy shit these guys are coming up and what they do is that they make people rather than destroying the tower they make different human beings speak different languages so they can no longer be in harmony Okay, so right now we, our society, even though that's that's an ancient story, but our society currently is in that position, and the different languages are are the visions of different nations. And so, what what is very fascinating for me is that world peace can happen in a day, in one day, and it happens with all the leaders of nations realizing that it's. It, how can I tell you? People are running this world. And people can gather in one room and come to a common conclusion. And at the same time as I say this, perhaps I'm saying it so simply because it's like as the ancient Greeks said, to tame the savageness of man and make gentler the life of this world. We tame savageness through finding a common language, and language is, is, is used to provide an image. Language is it, behind, within language, there, there's imagery that your mind is finding for that language. So when I say apple, for example, an image, like that word exists for an image, okay? Language is, is in some sense a response to image. Um, and I also consider language to be a technology. So we are in that moment where there's, 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 um, we have a commonality with that moment in the story of Babel where all the people spoke different languages. And so now what's going to happen is that the, the, you, the vision, the common vision is a universal responsible, respond, uh, responsibility. And it's like the true meaning of this responsibility is the closest word I could use. But it's a sort of, you begin to see that people begin living in a world where our differences are not judged and our commonalities do not hide from chaos. 
we internalize chaos. I hope in the next hundred years, wars become either digital, so you get <laughs> you get different world leaders to just like you know play replicate versions of of like like the military of their nations, but all in a digital virtual video game. You know, we go our wars become virtual, and so we begin to internalize chaos, but externally we allow there to be order and a sort of universal. Uh, a scent of universal freedom everywhere. And I will tell you, first it begins with you giving yourself a permission you have never given. And that is to be able to be in one moment and allow whatever idea of self you are to yourself to just be already in a free world. Once you give your mind freedom, it will fascinate you by, by its display. Beyond images, beyond emotions, beyond movement, noise, sound, uh, uh, silence and stills beyond the primary, the primal dualities of your universal philosophy. You live with a natural abidance of, when, when it's okay for others, to be better than you, to become greater than you, you have automatically allowed yourself your greatness. When you look at your world and you don't just, you know, cower in your shelter, <laughs> in your bunker of beliefs and, you know, lack of physical responsibility, for me, you know, if there was one command I feel the universe would give human beings, it would be like instantly smart enough. You are 8 billion plus creatures which have minds which can generate the most f fascinating subjective designs and can contribute these through different mediums, whether through language, writing, invention, whatever, you know, drawing or whatever. But you still have a sort of passion because you want to protect compassion. If you notice justice brings with itself passion, you know, that moment that fireman is like, you know, running into a burning building, there is a passion to protect the living. And to protect the living, you must protect the minds of the living and the bodies of the living. And so when I see there's so many people in countries that no, their bodies are in, in such difficulty with their environment and their survival has occupied so much of their lives that they perhaps may never ask who they are. They, have, they may per, perhaps never stare into the mirror and say, mind, why are you here? What have you to show? And so, <laughs> what I'm trying to get to is that we are, our next stage of evolution is to find the sort of common language and this will be a sort of geometrical recognition and recognitionally intelligent enough to when the environment becomes messed up, messed up, imagine the city just flies into the air and they're like, okay, whatever. You know, <laughs> a tsunami's coming, the whole city flies into the air that, you know, hovers in there until the tsunami and the wreckage passes. Just like B 
being able to shift efficiently into a world where you're seeing the spirit of the more. <laughs> you're seeing more than just what you're seeing. It doesn't mean you have to believe or disbelieve or identify with any shape. And it doesn't mean you have to be shapeless. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, be enlightened or unenlightened, be ideologically oriented or non-ideologically oriented. The next phase of the evolution of our species is an evolutionary return to nature where once we become, once every being experiences the unified nature of their presence beyond their personality, a source of universally motivated community will develop and culture will develop, global culture, where it's as if we are beginning to see we are no longer waiting for saviors. We, have, we are not even thinking as if we need to be saved or there is wreckage or like an, an inevitable uh, end of ends is coming. We're just saying there is something here worth living for. And the way we should live it is with a universal perspective. You're no little thing. You're a universal being. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with saying that. And it, it, it can't be invalid. You're, you're being in a universe. And you have evolved from this universe. So you are in some sense and have always been a universal being. But the, your relationship with your universe is what your relationship with your mind has been. And usually for most people, it's like the, a, a young child before learning language, its relationship with its mind is collective. But uh, when it, the child begins to learn language, its relationship becomes individual. So me and you, when we're giving this talk, we're, we're, we have tunneled too deep into, in some sense, we have matured into, <laughs> me and you are alive before many people are going to be born, okay? Live as a universal being, meaning be your whole moment of being and realize it's okay to use thought and it's okay to believe, but it is not okay to lose your self-awareness, to lose your awareness and an idea of self, which many moments go on and yet that idea is still keeping you there. People think shyness is just an external thing. You can be shy to know yourself. You can be someone who feels judged by your past of what you can do in the future. You can feel broken in a world fixed in a certain way. But the moment is the moment. And the sun rises. You know, <laughs> a new day is a new self. A new self is a new moment of universal presence and wakefulness. For me, there is no, there is no birth and death. There is just waking up to the world and going to sleep in the world. And when I go back to sleep on that last moment of being in this existence, I will bow down to my wakefulness. I will not hate life. I will not quit that. Not that I won't hate. It's just, I will look at like there's been moments where I've just like sat still in nature. Okay. And suddenly, like my eyes have been closed. And I've gone into this moment in my past where I've suddenly confronted the amount of suffering that's happening. The amount of suffering. Is ridiculous. 
And I remember I was just sitting in that nature. It's a very peaceful, you know, sunny day, but my eyes are just endless tears are just coming down on my face. And they were tears where it, I, there was not an emotion. It was like a reaction of, okay, let's say for now, okay, I'll, I'll be polite about it. It was a reaction of the soul to an image that was true, but he, no, nothing was being done. And not that nothing was being done, you know. I cannot tell the, the earth to, you know, uh, turn differently. But in the earth's turn, I can turn myself beyond where I have been. And any person let me tell you who's stressed or depressed or feels agitated or angry. I've even talked to people who they hated the world. Like I was, I was shocked, you know, because it was like at this party and the guy's like, I suddenly got angry and like about, about the mass illusion, you know, it's as if his, his, he was still like, he, you know, it's one can say anger is like the soul extending its arms, stretching its arms through chaos, okay? Sometimes chaos happens because a temporary creature wants to give a performance before it dies. Yeah. <laughs> the psychology of how we are so deeply social creatures is, is fascinating. Most people don't realize it. We, we live for life, regardless of its form. That will be, in some sense, found in the significance of the emblems of, you know, future efficiency. You know, imagine me and you right now, and everybody who's listening to this talk, and who would listen to this talk, we're all standing on, in a sky city, and we're looking from the edges from, of the fences of this sky city at the earth that, we, we, that cannot be accessed anymore. How much would we love our planet then when we lose it? How much would we understand that we were here, but we did not see what we could have done. For me, I, I, I had this idea, of, before I end off, guys, uh, I had this idea of um, certain commands, commandments, <laughs> that I wanted to, in some sense, certain moment, like, just like how Moses had written commandments, I wanted to take, to be, like, I, I wanted to write commandments, it was all humorous, but <laughs> and show it to the educational systems of, of, of our planet. And one of these commandments would be command every student to find the greatest idea that can help the species. Command the student to find a solution to a problem. Imagine young kids who they people say are the most creative when their people are like very creative when they're young. Like young kids, their minds haven't been, you know, they haven't heard the barks of dogma yet. <laughs> so they, they, in some sense, they have a very, they're living in, in a very pure, free world that the suffering has not entered yet. And so their creativity, if you notice, is just their, they, they already give themselves universal freedom before their name. Or even after their name, but they don't, like, how can I tell you? It's as if, like, uh, I don't believe, I, I feel I had this experience, I don't believe I'm the only one, but I feel most of my childhood, I wasn't fully, my attention, my consciousness, even my waking state, waking state wasn't always in my body. What I mean by that is, like, it's like I was, I was the ocean before suddenly a chunk of it, you know, 
right now I'm speaking to you very <laughs> poetically to the ice state. I am I have a shape of the moment in the language that I through the energy and through the energetic expression. But I to be honest We are just moments of changing energetic expression and language is a slower subjective kind of referencing system we use to allow the randomity of images in, in, in reality to have a subtler implication. Imagine kids come home and the mother is like to the kid, did you eat your lunch? And the kid's like, yeah, mom, you know? <laughs> And then the uh, mother is like, you know, what, so tell me, what's your homework? You know, the mother asks the kid to see if the kid knows what his homework is. You know? <laughs> and so, like, it's like, like the mother asks, what did they tell you in class or what, what happened or something? And imagine the kid says, our teacher came into class and told, told us the, you know, major problems with the world and told us to find a solution and assign each student with one solution. Assign one student to give an idea, uh, like their assignment was to give a solution to world hunger, give a solution to, you know, poverty, give a solution to corruption. And like, and then, the, the, you know, the parent would be like, oh my God, like, like what school is my kid going to? It's like living for humanity. <laughs> That's honestly a good name for a school, no? Living for Humanity. And uh, another commandment I wanted to, uh, I'll share this in a final <laughs> was that I, I think schools should be designed in, um, in vertical buildings where the kids have to climb a lot of stairs. So that's going to help obesity, first of all, not just flat horizontal hallways, but rather stairs to climb, you know, and that's intentional. And then the second thing the schools should do is that, like, when I was younger, I went to a school where I had to climb a lot of stairs, like, it would be crazy, we'd, you know, we'd play sports, I'd get really tired, and then I'd have to climb, like, tons of stairs to get to the classroom, like, you know, it was devastating at one angle, but it was helpful, you know, and, um, what, uh, just sorry. Uh, the, the, as 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 um, there's an architectural innovation in, in you know educational buildings, <laughs> um, the stairs should generate the power of the building. So imagine kids as as they step, the stairs are designed in a way. So imagine like a high school filled with like thousands, like a thousand kids or something, you know, like that high school, all these kids are climbing these stairs all the time. And with every step as they step to go to their classroom, it's generating, you know, some sort of electro, uh, electric power, you know. And so what I'm saying is that we got to begin making our buildings self, being able to generate themselves and eventually being able to lift off from the surface of the earth. You know, in a hundred years. <laughs> and uh, what that means is like the same strategy also can be applied to uh, one's inner realm where you're trying to make your life efficient in a way where not only it doesn't forget uh, humanity, it lives for it a little. Make sure some percentage of your life you're not just living for yourself, you're living for others. You know, those people who they're ready to get married and have a family, they're tired of just living for themselves, you know? Because every night could have its own pleasure, but one wants to experience the deeper states of life. You know, life is not about just, you know, as some, you know, modern poets or rappers say, excuse my language, you know, um, <laughs> They say like P pussy money weed, you know, they say this in rap songs, you know, and in some sense, it's not all about accumulation of identity because that's what wealth is. And it's not just that, it's also survival, but I'm, I'm saying it, it, that fits into it. The vision aligns the civilization. 
regardless of the face of that vision, regardless of the captain of the ship or who steers, it's, it's, it's like everybody's holding the steering wheel of their own reality. And you have to pilot your individual subjective realm and first be able to find a sort of alignment and comprehension with the physical universe. So one can say spirituality is not for someone who hasn't studied science. It's for someone who's been interested in the material universe. You know, not just trying to jump into some spiritual abstraction or belief system. You 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 look at the physical reality and you don't try. You confront it. And once you have confronted the presence and the existence of physical reality, you after you reach that threshold of contentment, then then you can wonder about the unknown. I recommend it like this. You know, you could do whatever you want, but I'm recommending it in a way that you you find the spirit of nature in front of your eyes before you find it behind. And what I mean by that is see the beauty of the world before you want to see another world. Because The reason we want our species to continue is because we want to, for the universe to remember us eternally. For me, I feel like the guest in this world. I feel I have come to see um, an old friend in you, you know, which is the expression the presence of my moment, my whole moment. It's not these thoughts I'm saying, it's not my body, it's not just what I'm looking at, it, it's, my, it's, it's the whole moment. It is prior for my effort to have been individualized to then, you know, play some games with the world. You know? Imagine when you go visit your, you know, a family member. When you speak to a family member, you automatically are not fake, you know? A crook, if even the most criminal person with their friend, with their, let's say, two criminal friends, you know, with their friend, they're honest. You know, it's like the how Plato said the justice among thieves or something. The honor among thieves, something like that. But the whole reason is I'm saying that is because I'm, every person is being honest because it's, it, it takes energy to lie. <laughs> Honestly, it takes energy. You know, you can't, you can't do it. You can't do, there's no time to be something you're not. And during this existential time, find what you are and find it in a way where it's aligned to the direct experience of the origin of your energetic expression. That means don't fight the world. Don't try to escape the world or transcend it or go somewhere in it. Learn to be in the world. And as you observe it innately through your observance, you will know you are what you are beyond. Your mind will begin smiling at the eyes that have dared to look at it. It's all, it's all show and tell. It's all a game of language. And uh, language is an opportunity. It is not something, it's like the moment you, it's like imagine you're holding a wrench in your hand and you don't, you think, like you have no idea, you, somehow you've forgotten that this wrench is not part of your hand. Okay? <laughs> so you think the wrench is like part of your hand. Okay? And so imagine suddenly you realize the wrench is not part of your hand. And for years you've been believing this tool that you've been using has been you. And suddenly you see you're not that tool and you feel an emptiness. It's as if your past habitual uh, perspective on reality suddenly cannot continue. And oh no. <laughs> and so, but in the emptiness of, and that recognition that we are not the thought, we are not the tool, we're not the wrench that we're holding. We can use the wrench in new ways. We can put down the wrench and find new tools. 
We, the ideas that are the solution to mankind are here. Where else could they be? You know, if the problem is here, the solution is here too. <laughs> That's the simplest way to find, you know, find that answer. You look at, you reverse engineer back to how the problem originated as a significance in your reality. And it's not like this, like, you know, law of attraction to robotic. Going to a certain guru and just telling you, like, do this, do that, do this, do this, you know, and, you know. <laughs> you know, like, you don't need to go to, um, you can choose to stand under any ideological banner you want, but as Molana Rumi, Jamaluddin Molana Rumi, this Sufi ancient, you know, poet said, Persian poet, he said, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a place. I will meet you there. And when the soul lies down on that grass, sits down on that grass, the world is too full to talk about. We are, I, I have to say this, guys, um, because I can't put pilots of consciousness in the title and not share this idea about it. The, uh, the idea of pilots of consciousness very quickly is, um, uh, the, 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 I mean, I talked about it a little bit, but this is the way I want you to kind of see it, that you're, you're navigating your moment. You're piloting your attention in the moment, okay? And you can pilot it again into an individual way of looking, being, and existing, or into a collective. When you do individual, you are in some sense uh, uh, oriented towards the perfection of shape. Uh, when you're in some sense going into a sort of collective, unified, empty being, <laughs> You, the moment you become a universal being, you're, you get access to the universal mind. You will begin experiencing your consciousness being simultaneously present in every point of your awareness. You begin to see infinities everywhere. And you begin to see the emptiness that is preserving infinity. And as these infinities, in some sense, collide, you begin to see the value of eternity and how dare, how dare any human being tell you or reject the idea of the eternal when our only effort is that. What is survival? It is an eternal When the eternal remember themselves, the temporal were just the gaze of novelty. Give yourself ultimate freedom. to navigate itself and pilot itself to where it needs to be. Learn from the self of selves the moment of being. <clears throat> Your moment of being. Yeah.
hope this talk has served you. Much blessings, I must say.